كلمة يقول So welcome back to our break. I hope that you had the possibility to enjoy lunch and that you liked it. So after the break and throughout the afternoon session, we will deal with the topic, how to become a data scientist. We've seen so many young faces here in the audience, and maybe they also now have their question in mind, I want to become a data scientist. And in the afternoon, we want to show you several ways how to get there. So in the beginning, we will have a performance by the CHS. Then we will have an impulse lecture by Jillian Augustine, and then we will have a panel discussion. But let's start with the art performance. Thank you very much. So the students of the CHS, together with their teacher, Larissa Tomasetti, developed a performance where they combine and they deal with the topic of data and virtual reality. They investigated the extent to which reality can be changed artificially and artistically and how we humans deal with it. Get inspired and get touched. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, get this. Okay. Uh, in addition to that, uh, welcome. On, uh, we're here uh, for the second time for the art performance. And um, also the performer's eyes, the mirrored performer's eyes are seen in the performance um, itself. And the story and illustrations were created by artificial intelligence. It's a combination between the ideas from our students and the artificial intelligence. And the story is... Uh, there are two parallel plots, one real and one artificial. Three real performers were transformed with makeup, and three gamers choose a character who suddenly comes to life. That's the idea behind. This raises a few questions. What reality do we perceive? When does physical reality mix with virtual reality? And what is real? Enjoy. Once upon a time, in a far-off universe, there was a planet called Elysium. Elysium was a beautiful planet, home to many different species of beings. There were humans, satyrs, angels, and even aliens. The planet was filled with magic, and it was said that anyone who visited Elysium would never want to leave. One day, an angel named Ella was sent to Elysium. Ella was a strong and powerful angel, and she had been tasked with protecting the planet from any threats that may arise. Ella knew that Elysium was a peaceful planet, but she also knew that danger could come from anywhere.
As Ella was exploring the planet, she came across a satyr named Pan. Pan was known throughout the land for his mysterious ways, but he was also a powerful ally to those he deemed worthy. Pan was surprised to see an angel on Elysium, but he was also intrigued. He had heard stories about angels, but he had never met one before. Ella and Pan quickly became friends and they spent many hours exploring the planet together. One day they came across an alien woman named Xena. Xena was unlike anyone they had ever seen before. She had bright green skin, long tentacle-like arms and large black eyes. Sina was lost and alone, and she was desperate for help. Ella and Pan took Xena under the wing and showed her around Elysium. Xena was amazed by the planet's beauty and magic. And she knew that she had found a new home. Michael, Pan and Xena quickly became inseparable and they spent their days exploring the planet and protecting it from any threats. One day, a dark force descended upon Elysium. It was an evil sorcerer who wanted to take over the planet and enslave all its inhabitants. Michael Pan and Xena knew that they had to stop him, and they set out the mission. With Ella's strength, Pan's cunning and Xena's otherworldly abilities, they were able to defeat the sorcerer and save Elysium. The people of Elysium rejoiced and Ella, Pan and Xena were hailed as heroes. From that day on, Michael, Pan and Xena continued to explore the planet and protect it from any threats that may arise. They became known as the protectors of Elysium and their friendship only grew stronger with each passing day. And so they lived happily ever after in a world full of magic and wonder.
Thank you very much for this fascinating performance. You all did a great job, and I think I can talk for all of us that we are all fascinated. And I would also like to thank your teacher, Larissa, where is she? <laughs> for us creating this very, very exciting and touching performance. Thank you very much again. Now, I'm very proud to announce today's keynote talk by Gillian Anderson. We invited Gillian to give a talk on the topic, a practical advice on transitioning into data science from a non-computer science background. Gillian is here with us. Hello, Gillian. Um, she will say hello and introduce hello. herself with a few words. Can you, can hello. you hear me? Can you see me? Yes, Gillian, thank you very much. I have to say, Gillian wanted to be here, but unfortunately she had a flight to catch, so we pre-recorded her talk, and we're going to stream the talk that Gillian pre-recorded, but as I understand, she's now at the airport of Vienna, and she yeah. still wants to be here with you and say a few words. Gillian. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for inviting me here. Um, as was said, I arrived back in Vienna not very long ago, but I managed to make it here. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to say um, thank you. Um, thank you to the organizers for inviting me today and also thank you for joining as well. Um, I think this this conference, this, this organization is a, is a great place um, to, to get women together and, and other genders uh, on the topic of data science. Um, I'm really happy it's my um, actually the second time I'm part of taking part in Women in Data Science. The first time was for Central Eastern Europe, this time for Villach. Um, and yeah, thank you. Um, thank you all for spending the time to, to look at my talk. I will introduce myself a, a little bit in the recording, um, but um, just briefly, I'm at Crayon as a principal data scientist. So I started my data science journey um, formally around five years ago now. Um, but before that, I had various other experiences which were very valuable for me in my career now. Um, and I'm sure some of you listening will also have those experiences that can really jumpstart your career in data science. So I hope you enjoyed the talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jillian. So we're now going to stream her talk that she re pre recorded. Um, she is a principal data scientist at Crayon's European AI Center of Excellence in Vienna, and she is going to give us her advice and tell us also about her way and how she got from a somehow totally different background into data science. Thank you very much. Hello everybody, welcome to my talk today, which is on the topic of transitioning into data science from non-computer science backgrounds. So I'd first like to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to speak today. Although I can't be there in person, I really appreciate um, being able to present and, and share my insights with you nevertheless. So jumping into the topic, when we think about transitioning to data, into data science, we're talking about often a career change. So if we think about um, the word career, at least in English, there are two different definitions of this. So first of all, you can have the definition of a noun, which is an occupation undertaken for a significant period of time in a person's life with opportunities for progress. So when you typically think of what this means, um, as you go through life, you can you go through certain, certain steps and you become more successful as time goes on. 
But interestingly enough, career is also a verb. And when we look at this definition, I think it also tells us something. So the definition of career is also to move swiftly and in an uncontrolled way. And, and when you think of a career in this sense, maybe you start off similarly to what you typically think of as a career. So making a few defined steps, but then you might see um, quite quickly that um, your career goes in different directions where you you wouldn't have originally planned. And I think most careers are actually more like the second definition than the first definition of the word. When looking at my individual career path here, I'm showing it um, as a line, but actually it is, as I said, a bit more a mix of the two. So I started um, my career um, quite traditionally, so studying biochemistry at the University of Leeds and then went on to do a PhD um, in the University of Vienna. Um, during my PhD, I decided that I didn't want to continue in academia and I wanted to move um, move into data science. So my first role in data science was at A1 Telecom Austria as a data scientist and a graduate in AI and data analytics. And then after that, I moved on to Mondi Group as a data scientist. And then finally, I moved on to Crayon where I currently am. In Crayon, I've had a range of roles. So I started as a senior data scientist in the data insights team. Then um, I became actually the head of the data insights team. So went um, into more of a management role. Um, but I decided after a time that this is actually not what suits me best at this moment in time. So now I'm currently working as a principal data scientist in the data insights team. And in my role as a principal data scientist, I have, um, I would say three main areas. So the first one is working on customer projects. So hands-on coding work. The second one is mentoring of junior or less experienced people in the team, specifically the data scientists in the team. And the third one is um, recruiting and hiring. So I, I also play a main role in hiring um, new talent for the team, also the other teams um, at in our data and AI um, department, so to say, at Crayon. So um, this, this new role, particularly of being a principal data scientist, has really allowed me to um, see different aspects um, related to what it not only what is needed when doing the work of a data scientist but also understanding um, what kind of um, talent is available on the market and how suitable that is for the data science projects that we currently see. So when um, I'm asked or when I ask people about transitioning into data science I see um, three main areas of questions um, those areas are thinking about the required skills, so what is needed to um, be a data scientist. Secondly, we have um, what learning is involved, so what do I need to learn to be able to become a data scientist. And the third aspect is getting hired, so um, how do I land my first data science job. And I'm going to talk about a few of those aspects today. So firstly, looking at skill requirements. Um, here I have a few points that I want to, um, to share with you. So first of all, um, if you're coming from um, a different career, which is not data science, you have a lot of experience and you lot of, have a lot of skills and strength in your home domain, so to say. And um, I think it's important to identify those and, and recognize them. Um, because when you're working in a company, you're hired to do a job. So you're hired to do data science for the company and to provide value to the company through your data science work. And seeing as you have a lot of strengths from your previous experience, you can really incorporate some of these strengths into your first data science job. And I will, um, I will cover a few ways of which you can do this a little bit later. Secondly, um, it's inevitable that you will have areas in which you need to improve. Every single person does. So it's also important to identify those areas that you need to improve on um, so you can really focus some of your time and energy on improving those areas. Um, 
as I said, everyone needs to improve, which means there's always something that somebody else needs, somebody needs to learn. So this is why I also stayed here. Don't assume you know everything. Um, maybe this doesn't speak to you, um, but there is so much more that there is to learn. Um, I would say generally, um, you can always be sure that you don't know everything about the subject that you need to know or that you would like to know. Um, and secondly, on the other point, um, don't assume that you can't learn anything new. So you could have been maybe working in your current um, non-data science role for, for many, many years, for example, 10 or 20 years. That doesn't necessarily mean that you cannot switch to another role because um, one aspect of data science is constant learning. And so um, it's a very solid assumption to make that there's no reason why you cannot learn anything new. So when I was moving into my first data science role um, in A1 Telecom Austria, I came across a bunch of acronyms. So a bunch of acronyms, words that I, I didn't understand or maybe I, I had only heard a few times. And some of them are listed here. Um, I'm not going to go through them all, but the point I want to make is that when you first move into data science, there can be a lot of business terminology that you might not know, especially if you're coming from the research or the academic background. This can be very unfamiliar to you and it's very natural and it's something that you learn with time. That being said, if you've worked um, in, in companies and business for a longer time, but maybe not in the data science role, a lot of this terminology will already be very familiar to you. And this you can see really as your strength. So, um, for example, when moving into data science roles, you have some people who are strong on the um, strong on the coding side of things or the science side, but not on the business. And you have other people who are strong on the business side, but maybe not on the coding or not on the science side as well. So um, overall, you have strengths. It's just a question of understanding um, which ones they are. So now I would like to go on to the topic of coding skills um, and just say a few words about these. So when looking at data science, I think there are um, three key coding languages um, which are really common and um, well established um, for use in data science. These are Python, R and SQL or SQL. Um, in terms of Python, I think it's a... Um, a very common language is well integrated into a lot of other software and tooling, which is not Python based. And because of this it's used across software development. So it's not only specific to data science. When we look at R on the other hand, this comes very much um, from more of an academic and research perspective. So it has a very strong statistical basis. You will find a lot of libraries in R um, around statistics and research in particular domains. Um, it also has um, a set of libraries called the Tidyverse, which are um, kind of a very good um, all around set of tools for data import and data manipulation, etc., which I will show on the next slide. And thirdly, with R, I personally found that the learning community was very welcoming. So R was the first coding language that I started learning. Um, in the meantime, I use Python more often. Um, and I think also Python fits more to my my way of learning, my just my general um, preferences. But I must say that the community, the learning community in R is, um, is very strong. Um, and then thirdly, we have SQL, which is um, based on databases. So data extraction, data manipulation is extremely powerful. So if there's any large scale data processing that needs to be done, SQL is definitely the best bet over Python or R. Um, and it's often used alongside other tools. Um, as a data scientist, this is probably not going to be the main um, coding language or syntax that you use, but I think it's definitely something that you need to be familiar with, at least with the basics, because um, 
data is often stored in databases, for example, and how do you get to that data? You use SQL. So you use SQL first and then maybe um, you do your data processing in Python or R, but I think it's a really powerful tool and um, you can save yourself a lot of time, literally physical time in terms of waiting for processing, but also um, a lot of um, time in working out how to write code and how to process code as well. If you have a have the basics of SQL covered, I would say. So one question um, I sometimes get asked is what, which tools should I be familiar with? And here on this slide, I just have um, a couple of tools from, so R packages and equivalent Python packages for standard data science tasks. So here, when we think of data science tasks, we have um, data import, data manipulation and cleaning, data visualization, and also machine learning. There's also deep learning, which can be covered, but this is not shown on this slide, but I think it's a good basis to um, say, um, if you want to move into data science, it's a good idea to have um, these, to be familiar with these um, Python libraries. Um, as a foundation. So um, understand the basics of them, understand how they work and um, crucially understand how you can use them um, in your work. Now looking at, um, again, at the point of coding skills, um, I have a few tips I would say on how to, um, how to tackle coding because it can seem um, at the beginning that it can be quite overwhelming there is so much to learn and I can definitely say that whatever coding language you learn you will not know everything in it this is just very this is very natural but even though it's overwhelming I really do think it's it's best to not try to avoid coding you might see that there are many um, low code or no code solutions available um, which can do um, basic data processing, visualization and modeling for you. But in my experience, as you develop in your career, um, as you have to start doing more complex, um, more complex tasks, you will see that you actually need to be able to dig into the actual code, be able to change the code itself. So I don't really think it's a, a viable approach to just avoid coding in general. Um, in terms of tackling coding, I definitely suggest start with what you know. So um, as I shown on the previous slide, there are some packages and libraries. I would say start with understanding one of those um, and then move on from there. So you really don't have to tackle everything at the same time. Also, um, when writing code um, and learning about coding in general, it's constantly a task of figuring it out. So often you might be given um, a certain piece of work that you have to do and it's up to you to work out how to use the code to fulfill the task. And in this sense, um, I just want to say, um, don't be afraid to ask other people for help in working out how to do this. but please understand that also Google is your friend. So the internet is your friend. The internet, I would say, is your best friend and has most of the answers. So um, I really think part of learning to code is, is learning how to work independently, using resources on the internet, such as documentation and tutorials to be able to get the information you need to complete the task. This also goes for troubleshooting and debugging and, and other issues as well. Um, I, I can repeat as many times as needed that um, um, learning is a constant process in data science. And so you're always going to have some aspect of figuring out what to do um, using different resources on the internet. Um, I would also um, recommend to think about where you want to be in the short term rather than the long term. Um, things change a lot over time. So um, you would see, for example, um, maybe five or six years ago, you heard the term um, 
you heard the term big data. Now you're not hearing that term so much anymore. We're still hearing the term data scientist, but also you can see the term machine learning engineer cropping up sometimes. These are two distinct roles, but often um, what some some companies consider data scientists, other companies will consider machine learning engineering. Um, what some companies consider data analysts, other companies will consider data scientists. So things are changing so, so quickly. Also in terms of, for example, the, the latest tools and technologies, we see this more, most recently with the use of large language models. So I really think it's best to stick to a short term plan of six months, what you want to learn in the next six months, rather than thinking of what you want to learn in the next two years, because there's a good chance that at the end of those two years, what you wanted to learn is not relevant anymore. Um, another question I get asked a lot is also, um, which language should I learn? Should I learn both Python and R? Um, and in terms of this, I really think, um, start with one language, know it well, um, and then it's easier to move into a second language. So I personally started learning R and then I moved into Python. Um, also, it's important to remember that you can learn more languages. So don't assume that um, if you start learning one language today, that means that you have to stick with it for the rest of your career or it's always going to be your main language. Um, it's always possible to learn um, other languages to fit the requirements that you need. And I've just noted at the bottom of this page um, a list of free books and resources that I have on my website um, containing step-by-step -step tutorials on a range of topics from data visualization, data processing, also to machine learning, and also the fundamentals of Python as well. I think there's also a link to fundamentals of R as well. Um, and these are some of the resources which I myself have also used or I've also heard about them um, as recommended resources for learning. So now I'd like to move on slightly to, um, we've covered a bit of business knowledge, coding skills, and now going into the scientific approach. So coming from academia myself and also knowing um, even now that there are many people who are working in academia who like to move out of academia, I just wanted to share with you um, the similarities I see between academia and data science, because it can seem that there is actually um, a big gap between the two, but in reality, there's not. So um, on this slide, I just showing um, some questions and I believe the slides will be available afterwards, so I won't go through all of these. But for example, um, when I'm working in the lab, for example, or when I worked in the lab, um, I would often ask myself these kinds of questions. So things go wrong all the time. And what do you do in the lab when things go wrong? You have to perform quality checks at each stage of your long experiment um, to see if the output is what you expect. And it's exactly the same in data science. You will see this in print messages, in terms of logging, also in terms of um, breakpoints in the code to, to be able to stop at different points in the longer process and really investigate what's going on in these. In terms of, um, can I trust my result? In, in, the, in the lab, we often use positive and negative controls in our experiments so we can compare our outcome to a common standard. And this is also what happens in data science is whenever you are doing um, analytics or for example, machine learning, um, you're developing machine learning models, you always set some sort of statistical baseline. So some baseline performance on which you can, um, on which you can compare the results of your model or your analyses. Um, and the last one I'd like to highlight here is um, a question which I think should be asked more, which is how do I show the value of my work? Um, in both cases, both for academia and data science, it's really about clear written and verbal communication in understandable language. So now moving on to learning and proving what you know. Um, this 
um, this topic comes up um, relatively often and my personal choice of recommendation is through personal projects. So this means having a few projects, um, for example, on GitHub in which you take a data set, you clean it, visualize it and also do modeling on it. Um, in terms of whether online courses are useful, I think they really can be. Um, if um if you really benefit from a this structured um path but they don't i wouldn't say that they're necessary but i really think looking looking at the market now and looking at the kind of candidates um that i'm seeing i think sharing your work on github is essential to show that you understand git and the fundamentals of it and also in in this vein demonstrating um your collaboration with others um, so, um, in terms of using Git, often people work alone, um, and can understand the basics, but I think it's really a major advantage to show that you can also work with other people, um, when, when using Git as well. So these don't have to be people, you know, in person, it can be anyone on the internet. There are definitely, for example, forums, groups, meetup groups, where you can, you can work together on different projects and, and demonstrate your knowledge that way. I've also been asked about um, how necessary it is to understand the cloud computing. And I think it's becoming more and more necessary as models are becoming more complex. Um, but I would say it's really something that should only be tackled after grasping the basics of coding. Otherwise, I think it can be very confusing. And um, whereas for um, the general data science knowledge, I personally don't see certifications as super beneficial. I think for cloud computing, this could be one of the cases where they can be beneficial because um, it can be otherwise, um, unless you have experience working in a certain position, it can be difficult to demonstrate that you have um, a, set, um, a level of understanding about um, cloud computing, whether that be AWS or Azure um, or GCP as well. Um, I would say of the different um, cloud providers out there, AWS and Azure are the two main ones. Um, so if I could make a recommendation, I would, I would go for learning one of those. So now I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about hiring insights. So um, I've been um, involved in recruiting now for, I would say around three years. Um, and in the past, in the past 18 months or so, I've been taking more of a, a lead role in hiring um, people. So I think I've, I have some insights which I'd like to share today. Um, these are mainly my personal impressions, so other people's impressions might differ, but I still think um, there, there can be some valuable insights there for everyone. So starting with some things which are more general and, and you've probably heard before um, include um, identifying the skills listed in the job description. So um, this is really a basic of checking that you've, you've read the job description and you understand what's expected. Adjust your CV to match the job description. So if there are um, certain skills that you have which are required um, for the job, then really mention those explicitly on the CV. And a personal point um, for me is highlight the skills you used in a project rather than the project itself and explain your role in the larger context. So um, sometimes I will see that there is um, a description of a project in general and what happened in general. Um, so what was the purpose, what was the outcome? But it, for me, it's difficult to tell what the person actually did. So really explain what your role was in a larger project and also um, explain what skills you use. So for example, what, um, what tooling did you use to achieve your goal? Now, um, in terms of also describing the work you've done, it can really depend um, how you write it on your CV can depend on what type of team you are applying to be in. So uh, generally, I would say if you're working in a tech team, it's good to um, 
focus on the modeling approach that you take rather than the model accuracy. Um, from my personal perspective, if I see a model achieve 95 or 98%, it doesn't make much difference to me. There's a good chance that that is only, it, it's more um, telling of the data rather than the skill of the data scientist often. So I, I'm much more interested in knowing the modeling approach. However, when we're looking at thinking about going into business teams where you really want to show the value of the work that you've done, I would emphasize business impact. So um, using business KPIs, so key performance indicators and business metrics over the implementation details themselves. And finally, um, a last point, thinking about formal degrees. Um, when I started working in data science, there were no there were no formalized, for example, master's studies. Now I see that there are some more formalized um, programs. And I think it's a it's a good structured way to learn certain content. Um, in my experience, it tends to be um, teaching basic to intermediate levels of coding and also the theory of different machine learning algorithms and concepts. But I've not seen... Um, data science graduates with extensive business experience or using coding best practices code um, and collaboration best practices. Um, so in, in my personal opinion, I think it can be good as a formalized structure of learning, but I don't necessarily see it better than doing um, an online course or a series of online courses or a different bootcamp. So, um, in my second to last slide, I would just like to talk about a um, a few mistakes, you could say, or a few misconceptions that I've seen. So I think um, good communication, so being able to communicate verbally and written in a written form is as essential as good code. Sometimes people get the impression that it's not as important as coding, but I think that if you can't communicate what you've done, it won't be understood or accepted by other people. And other people um, can mean, in some cases, the customer, the client, but it can also mean your fe fellow developers as well. So it's really important to be able to explain your work well. Um, a second point is that when you start coding, um, it can be understandable that you're unsure about your code so you might not be so confident in it and sometimes this can lead people to be a bit protective or secretive about their code um, and I really think this is something that should be avoided so I think even though it's uncomfortable I really encourage you to share your code collaborate with others um, and I think this is the best way that you can learn from others and you can make your code better if nobody sees your code nobody can make your code better um, and a third point, which might seem a bit strange, is um, don't try to argue your way into a job. So I can understand that if you've heard some um, some negative news from from an interviewer or a recruiter, it can be very frustrating. Um, but I, I rarely think that it's a good idea to try to make the interviewer change their mind after they've made the decision. Um, I think it's much better to um, focus on asking for feedback from the interviewer, understanding the feedback and understanding why you can improve in your next interview. And it's important to bear in mind that um, your role in an interview is to convince and show the interviewer that you are a good fit for the position. This means if they've not specifically asked about an experience that you think is relevant, I really recommend highlighting this anyway. I've recently seen an example of a candidate who asked, um, what would you say are the key areas that you are looking for in a candidate? And then basing the candidate based their answer on what I said. And I think this is a really good um, way to maybe get information or convey information to the interviewer that they might have not explicitly asked for. But overall, I think once an interviewer has made um, um, made their decision, it's best to accept that. And the the network of data scientists is small, so it's always a chance that you can um, you can maybe apply for a position at a future date um, if you you leave the interview on a good note. 
And finally, I'd, I'd like to say a few words about landing your first data science role. So um, if you are in academia or research, I think the perfect time to move out of academia is yesterday, um, meaning um, sooner rather than later. Of course, if, they're, if you are just finishing, for example, just finishing a master's or a PhD, it makes sense to stay a bit longer to be able to um, complete this um, formal education achievement. But if you're, if you've finished and you're, for example, a postdoc, really there is no benefit that I see on the market from uh, a benefit of doing a four-year postdoc as opposed to a one-year postdoc. I think um, I think it in a way um, prevents you from learning other key skills that you need to know, such as um, business experience or coding. So I would really um, recommend moving sooner rather than later. On this topic, I would also um, expect to make a sidestep first when moving into a data science role rather than um, a step up. So, for example, um, some some thoughts that, or some thoughts or ways of thinking which are good to avoid, which um, include, for example, thinking because you had a senior role in a previous position that you expect to be a senior data scientist, or for example, thinking that um, if you have a PhD that you don't want to apply for jobs in which only a master's is needed. So both of these. Um, these thoughts or ways of thinking are things that I've experienced myself and I've also experienced in the sense that from my social circle I know this is also how people think um, but I, I definitely think it's best to avoid thinking like that and be prepared to take a side step first. Um, in this sense also being humble is, is very important so also thinking um, acknowledging that you have learning to do and you have experience that you want to gain um, and not thinking that you're going to find the perfect job straight away. Um, you might be working in a job which is not exactly um, your main passion but you are still able to learn a lot from this and learn, gain a lot of experience and thus I think it's still very valuable. Um, and finally, there are lots of different companies which are looking for data scientists. There are traditional companies which maybe have a very solid foundation um, in IT um, and the foundational software needed, whereas you might have modern companies in which are using more modern state-of-the-art um, tooling and tech stacks. We also have larger companies in which you will often find there are many people there who have extensive knowledge on various subjects which you can learn from, whereas you have smaller companies where um, you might be expected to wear many hats, so to say, um, and you would learn a lot more hands-on. Um, one thing about the larger companies, though, is that often your range of responsibilities is smaller so you can really focus um, on on becoming an expert in one thing I would say. And finally um, the first position so the first data science position is definitely the hardest um, to achieve I would say um, which is why for example I strongly recommend taking a side step rather than uh, um, waiting for a step up um, but after you've gained the first data science position, it gets a lot, lot easier. So um, in that sense, um, if you're currently looking for your first data science position, this is as hard as it's going to get. Once this is over, it's going to get a much easier. And with that, I just want to say thank you for listening um, to my talk today. I hope there have been some some useful insights, things that you can um, you can take away that can help you and your um, your professional development. Um, and yes, um, thank you for your attention and I wish you a good day. So, following the input of Gillian Augustine, we will now see a panel discussion on the topic how to become a data scientist. Therefore, we invited four women 
to hear and learn about their experiences and their thoughts and suggestions to become a data scientist. We have here um, for ladies, and I would like to ask them to join me here on stage. Manuela Gassa. Uh, she's here. Manuela Gassa, she's a data scientist at Infineon Technologies. And she's also a student here at QS. She's just finishing our master program in applied data science. Then we invited Isabella Hinterleitner. So where is, is she here? Isabella is here too. She's the founder of Tech Meets Legal and the board member of Women in AI Austria from Vienna. Then we have Christina Morgenstern. She is a researcher and she works at the Pedagogische Hochschule Kärnten in Klagenfurt and she's also responsible for the Girls in Data Science project here at the Women in Data Science Conference. Finally, we invited Lili nemetz Slatulas. She is a professor in informatics at the University of Maribor in Slovenia. And, and it's very nice, um, Lily, she is also part of the Athena network that also here our University QS just joined recently. Thank you. Please. So thank you very much for agreeing to take part in this panel discussion. So the very first question is the most easiest one, okay? So what inspired you to become a data scientist? Manuela, maybe you can start. Is that on? All right. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me here today. So um, I'm glad to be once also on the other side <laughs> um, of this uh, whole event. Um, for me, the becoming a data scientist was not like... Um, one moment decision. There was not, not this like one moment in history uh, where I knew that I want to be a data scientist, but I more or less um, grew into that role. So uh, in my former occupation, um, I originally I come from engineering, and in my former occupation, I was uh, more and more facing tasks where I had to do uh, data analysis, so getting information out of data, gaining knowledge from data, and um, on the one hand, that was really interesting, really fascinating, because even though I deemed myself to be a domain expert, um, I also often found out uh, things that were completely unexpected to me. Um, and on the other hand, I really noticed that I was lacking skills, that I, would, uh, that I could not really get everything out of the data, because I just did not know how. Um, and it was basically at the same time when I just um, needed to decide what to do for my master's degree. And then this um, applied data science study program came into existence at the university here in Villach. And so it sort of was a perfect match because I realized that this is something I really want to take a deeper dive into. Um, yeah, and now I'm in the position to finishing my master's degree. I'm already working as a data scientist at Infineon and couldn't be happier about it. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, um, Isabella, what do you think? What are the essential skills and qualifications needed to become a successful data scientist? Okay, I'm very glad I didn't get the, the previous question. <laughs> Well, you can answer Thanks. the first one too. <laughs> no, no. Uh, so, um, yeah, the, the skills for the perfect or for just any any Successful. Kind of Successful. Successful. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, like like Chilean Augustine already said, I would say communication is very essential. <clears throat> I've also seen a lot of good data scientists that can do good coding but less than that can do good communication. <laughs> so communication in terms of uh, really um, working together with the team, uh, communicating if I'm not able to successfully finish a task <laughs> because I need help. Yeah, asking for help is not the, the easiest thing to do, but um, it starts at the PhD level. If I, I see that I can't finish something early, enough or if I have troubles doing something, it might be very um, 
good for your uh, boss or whoever is giving you the money to, s to tell him in advance because then you can react and um, get data scientists. I, I don't say, I, I would not say every d data scientist uh, likes the communication, but um, yeah, it's essential, I would say. Hmm? Thank you very much. Well, I think that answers it. And now that we Chris have Christina here from an educational background also, so what are the possibilities for young people here in Carinthia to engage themselves also in STEM subjects, not only in data science, but also in STEM? Because as we've seen from Jillian before, she came from biochemistry, molecular biology, and ended up in data science. So obviously, there are different paths and ways to get there. So, but how do we get into STEM firsthand, Christina? Okay, so, well, I have a STEM background as well. I'm a mo molecular biologist by training with a PhD in genetics, but I've left the silo of science and I was very interested in passing on my passion for science to, to young people. And I've worked in the educational and science communication field for the past years. And, well, you have seen one of such possibilities of engaging young students in uh, STEM activities today. That was Girls in Data Science. I'm still thrilled by the work of the students that they did within the last month. But in Carinthia, we have a lot more to offer for young students who would like to um, be more immersed in um, science, technology, engineering and math. So I'm actually a talent scout and um, a national uh, team chef of the European Olympiad for Experimental Science, so for the Austrian national teams. There is a yearly competition, an EU-wide competition, an interdisciplinary one where teams of um, students aged 16 and younger compete, um, three of them in a team, and they have to tackle interdisciplinary uh, science challenges on two days. So they have to do practical tasks in the lab um, pertaining to chemistry, physics, and, and biology, of course, and acquire data, analyze the data, and yeah, to get it right as well. So they are competing for medals. I actually just came back from the European Olympiad of Experimental Science in Riga just a few weeks ago. So, but there are other possibilities as well. We are um, having a, working with the government in Carinthia. So we have talent workshops for students in the different STEM fields. But we're also starting very early also in primary and in kindergarten, so we have initiatives as well. There is the mini educational lab in Villach um, for pupils aged um, three to six. I think my opinion is also uh, into that. Yeah, so if I could. Thanks, Christina. Very exciting also working with you together in this field because she has very broad knowledge in how to, to enter the field and how to get also some financial support if you want to um, encourage young women and girls for STEM subjects. So, but let's imagine like Jillian, she has a degree in molecular biology. Um, Lily, what do you think? What does it take to make the transition from a non-data science job to a data science job? And I see some faces here also in the audience where I know that they made this transition from non-data science into data science. So what would you say? Uh, yeah, well, I think we have seen a lot of faces today that have not started in data science because maybe there was no program in data science yet when they started. So I think it's never too late, as Gillian said. And uh, for me personally, I also studied an interdisciplinary studies. Uh, I was quite pushed back when I said I wanted to study computer science and I didn't have a lot of support, but this didn't stop me. At the end, I still um, came to this um, place where I am now uh, teaching database modeling, SQL uh, programming, and so on. So I think it takes a lot of 
courage to become a data scientist and a, a lot of um, eagerness of an individual to just start learning because you can always start even if you are 40, 50 years old. Um, for me, data is just something really fun. I like to play with numbers, create graphs, so this is why I really like the field. Thank you. Now, oh, a question, and I'll leave it just up to you who wants to answer that. So, what do you think, what are the common challenges and hurdles faced by individuals trying to break into the field of data science, and how can these challenges be overcome? Manuela. Yeah. Um, well, um, depending on if you are already in a company where you want to start as a data science, as a data scientist, or um, if you are not yet um, in a certain company where you really, if you're not yet in a situation that you really want, uh, that you really know in which direction um, you want to go, finally. Um, but in my case, I already worked at Infineon before I was a data scientist, and then I decided to, um, that I want to work as a data scientist. And here the biggest hurdle for me was that um, I completely underestimated the internal um, IT structures, the internal um, data structures we had. Um, and because I only knew this like university environment where we work, um, where we learn the basics in, in Python coding and stuff like that. And you normally um, start with um, like nice data sets, so to say, when you learn these, um, these algorithms and, and methods and um, also um, the basic structures of how data warehouses work, data lakes work. Um, and in the end, you have to just experience that yourself and try to get uh, knowledge from, um, let's say, more experienced colleagues on the internal structures um, of your uh, FI landscape, um, because this is really difficult in the beginning, especially if you work for a very big company that grew over years, like Infineon has a, quite a long history already um, here in Villach, and many things are like historically grown. Um, yeah, and this is very challenging from time to time. Oh, I see. So what are some practical steps that individuals can take to gain really hands-on experience in data science? <laughs> practical, um, <clears throat> yeah, let me think, uh, practical. I would say the experience training on job is very important and um, think about it as you, you, like also Chilean said, you can't know everything in your, in your new job. Um, also the, the, the abbreviations in the big company, it's like a jungle of, like a war of abbreviations. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm sure Infineon has the same. Um, with a smaller company, it's much easier because you you might uh, be the uh, you might know everything after one week or maybe several weeks. Um, another practical advice, um, yeah, is uh, uh, yeah out of the research perspective. Um, Failure will be on 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 your way. So so you 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 won't be successful each time you you compile and you do something. Um, it's a lot about learning from failures because um, okay. you, if you copy something from even if you use um, um, a container and you try it on another machine and the machine is a bit different, it it's not working, and then you try and try and try, and you find out maybe it's just one small flag that you should have set to another direction. <laughs> and, and this flag costs you two weeks or 10 days, and this is an enormous amount of money for um, a small company, for a big company. You might have the, the really lucky option to talk to your colleague, and he might say, remember there was this flag you could do you could say, it. but uh, yeah, like it's a lot of trial and error. And in a, in a research perspective, um, that was I, I was working at, at Silicon Oster Labs in the beginning, uh, founding a machine learning lab. It needed us a lot of time to 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 talk to the people who were were giving us the money to tell them it takes a lot of time because it's not working. From the moment on, you set up the machine. Yeah. 
So thank you. I heard you saying also the word colleagues. And Lily, that's a question for you. So what do you think, how important is collaboration and teamwork, as we've heard here, in data science? And what are some strategies for building effective teams in this field? Yeah, I think teamwork is always very important. And um, since we are at Women in Data Science, it's also very important to find uh, that female find female mentors who understand them even early on and then later on in their career when we become mother mothers and it's a bit harder to tackle with uh, family life and everything. Uh, so I think teamwork is extremely important. It's very important that you find someone you can trust, you can um, get help from. Um, and also to find this community to just feel be best at your job. Thank you. I think you mentioned something very important we haven't heard before. Um, it's mentorship. You said it would be great to have like a female mentor. I remember but during my habilitation at the Medici University in Innsbruck, I got a female mentor and she took care of me. And I think that was also a very important step in my career but I haven't seen this really here yet. Christina, what do you think? How can we also raise, especially here in a rural region, you know, with very traditional patterns also, how can we raise the awareness for gender issues in STEM education? Well, you have to start very early, and you have to, or well, we are starting with the teachers, so the teachers that are educating our, our kids, um, because I'm part of uh, teacher education at the University College, and we have a, a special direction for these teachers, which they can choose, and which is in STEM education. So the, we have primary teachers uh, which have uh, studied um, STEM didactics, so they know um, how to um, make a hands-on uh, science lessons, so they do lots of experiments uh, with the kids, and that from an early age on. They also go to the kindergarten, where actually a lot is already happening. A lot of kindergartens have like their science um, corners, and they already do very simple experiments. But it is, it's imp also important that you um, know how to how to to teach them, and that you're also bringing this gender aspect. Um, very early on and our students they learn that during their studies and I think that is a good starting point. Yes, I think that's also that leads me also to the next question. So as we are data scientists here and we are all like in double roles also being mothers and having lots of responsibilities on our shoulders. So what do you think, what are the main difficulties and hurdles for women in data science? Um, yeah, I don't know about a lot of hurdles in data science because I just joined data science very recently, but um, for example, um, what I often um, experienced, mm, not directly, but more like secondhand, is that there are still a lot of, um, there's still a lot of thinking out there that women sometimes get into a certain position or get certain attendance just because they are women. So, I mean, of course, there are sadly still some out there um, who fulfill that stereotype, but I think they are definitely not the majority. And um, we work as hard as men to gain our goals and to, to get good um, in a field, get expertise in a field. And I think we really have to get rid of these stereotypes that we are just like sort of um, presented with things like um, we work for um, for our for our career and um, this is true for being a data scientist as for any other occupation um, also in non mint um, non mint um, areas and yeah I think this is also uh, a point where society really needs to um, work work over yes. <laughs> so, yeah. I, I see I, I understand totally your point. So when we talk about data science and we heard Jillian 
telling us to, to leave academia as soon as possible. <laughs> well, I passed that point. So, <laughs> how, but when you do, and you work here for a company or something, so you're far away from your teachers and professors, how do you stay updated with the latest developments and trends in data science, and what resources or communities do you recommend for continuous learning? Sabella. Yeah, like, also like Chilean said, in um, Python, there's a really large community, depending in which field you are, um, there are stronger and less stronger ones, like computer vision, for example. Um, the, there, the, the best way to stay up to date is continue and improve and show your code to others and try to upload it on GitHub and different um, sharing, sharing hubs, <laughs> re repositories, um, try to get feedback. Um, yes, um, I would say that that's the usual. Yeah. And, and from, from my side, I would say a domain which is really, um, try to choose a domain or if you can choose, um, normally it depends if you come from mobility and you do data science, then you might go to mobility and do data science. Um, if you have done previously something like molecular biology, it might, you might end up in a field which is more biology based and do data, data science there. But still, um, my, you, you might be open to, to see yourself and find yourself in other disciplines and that's also key to data science, to apply your knowledge in, to another job that you previously, uh, that you leave your com comfort zone and, and apply your knowledge in another domain. Mm -hmm. So, how important is domain expertise in data science when you say we're coming from a lot laboratory, for example, Lily, and what strategies can be employed to gain domain knowledge in a particular field? Because sometimes we have a very general education, say, applied data science, and then we, for example, go to um, selling computer games. So, how important is domain knowledge as a data scientist? Yeah, I think it's probably not too easy to transition, but still, if you have basic knowledge in data science, you could apply it in different domains. And also, data science encompasses different fields that you need to be aware of. You need to know statistics, machine learning, data, uh, engineering and so on, so I guess the most important thing is that we just constantly educate ourselves, as we've heard already, um, and just try to update our knowledge, and then we, when we come to a certain domain, we try to get as much info as possible prior to starting. Yeah. Thank you. Is there anything you would like to add to the others? Manuela? Yeah, maybe to the previous question, yes. like getting, um, being up to date in terms of recent developments. So um, what I could really uh, highly recommend for, especially for um, beginners, is the platform DataCamp. Mm -hmm. So um, this offers a very um, huge, like everything a data science heart um, desires, basically. So starting from data um, pipelining, data preparation over different coding um, languages and strategies to data visualization. You can do lectures, you can do webinars, courses, whatever. So you find a lot of material there. And I would also recommend to listen to the one or the other podcast, actually. So there is a lot of good material out there. I don't know even which one to recommend, but um, they are all quite up to date. So that what I want to add to the previous question. What was the last question? No, <laughs> that's sorry. okay. So data camp. So yeah. it's yeah. about you know further education. Yeah. We're far away from you, or far away, years away from academia. So how do we stay updated, and how can we educate ourselves for continuous and lifelong learning? Yeah, that that was basically. I meant the other question, which came afterwards, <laughs> because okay. I jumped back one question and that's then <laughs> sorry. <laughs> And then I forgot the domain expertise. Yeah. Ah, domain expertise, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, yes, um, as I said previously, I used more like data analysis in my 
previous domain like automation engineering, so I was a domain expert in that field. And um, even though being a domain expert, um, I learned through data science that I don't know everything, so also the domain expert doesn't know everything. Um, and on the other hand, um, as a data scientist, of course it's nice if you have some expert knowledge or at least um, a, a little bit of knowledge about the domain um, because it helps you to um, ask the important initial questions when you start to work with your stakeholders, you want to understand their use case, um, you really have to repeat these questions, uh, what is needed by whom and why, um, over and over again to really understand the use case and this is just easier if you already have some domain knowledge but I think it's very important to work closely together with your domain experts and really also rely on that they provide you with the knowledge that you need and then to again provide them what they need. So, yeah. Yes, I think so too. So I remember I once had to do a statistical analysis of soccer games and find out why FC Bayern München was so successful also. So I was watching soccer on TV, which I never did before. I found it really exciting in the end too. So, you know, gaining domain knowledge could also be exciting, couldn't it, Isabella? Yes, I, I would like just to add something to the previous question. Okay, <laughs> sorry. please, go ahead, sorry, but lifelong sorry. learning. Uh, then, because you said data camp, which is really important, uh, apart from data camp, I would say LinkedIn learning is a really great source also. And follow Thank Catherine. You. Yes, <laughs> I wanted to say actually Catherine is one of the really very good uh, natural language um, experts there and preparing courses and she also started from another um, profession and, and is doing really, really great job there. So please follow LinkedIn Learning. <laughs> Okay. Sorry for the sidestep. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you a lot. So, um, if you already have your microphone in hand, can you also please describe your involvement with women in AI? Okay. Um, yeah, so um, here also with one head um, with women in AI in Austria. That was that is an association so, uh, that is for, has been founded in 2020. Uh, by Karina Zehetmeyer and Gabi Bolek Fügel, they are both our main um, yeah, uh, vice president and, and president. Um, the, the main goal, well, we have three different goals actually. One is um, uh, uh, co-organizing co and hosting events in the, in the framework of AI. Um, the other one is uh, education and in, in education we have one really uh, interesting um, framework um, project that is uh, an Erasmus Plus project and another one that is an Arbeiterkammer project and it's all about uh, data science and AI I would say and how to teach people coming from a non-tech um, way from a, from a, even from a humanities and social sciences perspective, because that's the really difference to Chilean. Chilean was doing um, a biomolecular um, education beforehand and having a PhD. So we are looking at people that don't even have the PhD. They are in a master's bachelor, are uh, women around 35 who have two children or one, one child where, and they want to do a career change and this is very challenging for those people and how should we support them and this is one of the main goals in this Erasmus Plus project also. Sorry, now I'm, I was already, already no, jumping to the other mm -hmm. topic. <laughs> that's, that's perfect. Would you like to tell, tell us a little bit about Erasmus Plus? Yes, so this is um, a project that we luckily got funded last year in um, April. It was uh, handed in by two of our experts, Valerie Harves. She is a policy advisor uh, in, in Women in AI. So this is actually our third, uh, uh, third domain. What we do in Women in AI is policies, education and, and events right, right at this moment. And of course, expertise, sharing expertise. So. Um, Valerie and Rania Vasia. Rania Vasia is a member of the Vienna Data Science Group. She, uh, uh, they, they founded or they, they set up this project, which is together with three, no, four, four big universities, Spain, Italy, Romania, Vienna, and uh, the group, uh, the, the association, 
uh, women in AI Austria, and the, the main goal is, like I said, we want we would like to support uh, women in social and human human science to get this jump into data science, which is even harder for someone who has never been in a technical career path. Because um, molecular biologists, for sure, they had some stats, they had some math lessons somewhere in the career. But um, if you come from, um, yeah, not even I would say even psychologists had some math. But if you come from um, linguistics, main, mainly only linguistics, not computational linguistics, it's very hard to jump to make this jump. And um, I, I presume these uh, these people. They have the skills, but you need an, an, a, a very good setup and environment. And what is also needed, that, that's what we are um, researching and trying to find out. Uh, what, what, what do the companies need? What kind of knowledge do companies need to apply this? Because big companies, they think they need, uh, they, want, they expect everything. The, if you see the job offers, they would like from everyone should code very well and should have um, a perfect domain knowledge and um, should have at least five years of experience in that field, whatever. And if you, if you look at yourself, and you women or a woman, you might find uh, yourself in the spot and see, even as a good data science, you say, hmm, um, I think I'm not suitable for this. <laughs> and and if, you, if you're not a data scientist, even worse, you might never think about the career change at this step, and that's why we talk to Fre Frequentis, ÖPP, um, Ernst and Young, and uh, talk to them about their, their um, expectations they have. Mm. Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you, that's excellent, and also to see how, how much is investigated and invested to get women also into data science. Mm. Um, now we're talking about Erasmus Plus. There's something else that's very interesting. It's Athena. It's a corporation of European universities that also permits students and workers at university to change between the institutes. So Lily, could you talk a little bit about Athena and how you are involved in that? Uh, so I was primarily involved in the beginning of this project and now we are submitting another proposal for uh, uh, for the Athena project. So in this second part I was involved in gender equality uh, part at all universities. So also currently each university that wants to apply to Horizon or other European project has to have a gender equality plan. So this is already one step towards getting more women in uh, computer science, uh, getting more professors, more role models, and so on. So uh, this is also my passion. We also have like a group that's not part of Athena, but part of our university. Uh, it's Ladies in Informatics, where we just join together different researchers uh, that uh, have the same goal of encouraging getting more girls and getting more female at positions uh, at the faculty. But the main idea of the Athena is there are a few universities uh, all around Europe that are connected into uh, one um, yeah, common uh, group. And uh, the idea is to get the best from each university so that the students could listen to the best teachers in data science or in geography or in any other field uh, and that the foreign teachers, for example from Porto or from any other institution that we are connected with, uh, would just teach the certain uh, part of the course. Uh, so this is still in development but you know Europe wants to be more connected uh, and wants to just be um, competent and in line with U.S. colleges and uh, everyone else, so, yeah. Oh, I, th I see you're also very passionate about it, and as you said, so my, from, from the panel discussion, my last question to each and every one of you, and I would like you to answer, you know, just from the bottom of your heart, what are your feelings about that? And then the discussion is open also to the audience, is why do we need more women in data science? 
Manuela. Um, yeah, maybe t um, first to grab up something that has already been said, I think at least twice today. Um, every um, area, every professional area profits from diversity. So um, women just bring different things sometimes with them than men, than gender neutral people, whatever. So diversity is always a key for um, better results, I would say. And um, secondly, I think that um, also concerning um, team structures, so not only from an, um, let's put it like professional, a hard skill point of view, but also from a soft skill point of view, I think teams work better when there is not only, or a dominating um, male uh, share in the team, or, or also a dominating female share in the team, so I think that Har most harmonic teams are balanced um, and that's the, the nicest thing to work together if, if there is a harmony in the team. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Please. Um, yeah, le uh, let me refer to this. Uh, there were the three triangles in the, in the center of, of Chilean's presentation where we had uh, the coding, the, the skill, coding skills business, I think women are very good in taking in each of those, those three uh, fields and, and changing in between and even if they are not very good in coding but they can do the very well in, in business level and they can do very well in a, in a communication in, and at another domain level and compensate maybe this uh, coding level which they can't do, for example, for career changes in the beginning, it will be very hard to, to do coding as excellent as someone who has done, who has five years of expertise. So uh, uh, having in mind these three um, circles and also this interdisciplinarity, I think it's very important to, to offer women a job in, in this perspective. Mm. Thank you. Christina, I know you're also very encouraged since I know you in person, why do we need more women in data science? Well, because humans are building the algorithms that are solving our problems of the future, and if women are not part of this process, there is the danger that there exists some bias that can reinforce, and for that reason, I think it's of utterly most importance to have teams that are as diverse as possible, so to not make these mistakes. Thank you. Lily, what's your... Yeah, what's my ad? Because yes. I agree with all of them, <laughs> of course. Uh, but uh, maybe I would add that we need more role models. If girls will not see any data scientists, they will not enter the field. It's, uh, and with role models, we can also get mentors. Uh, as I said before, so this is the crucial part, I would say, that we need to take care of. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Are there any questions from the audience to our panelists? Catherine. Yeah, thanks, couldn't agree more. Um, so just wondered if you um, could name some specific figures that you like to follow. I'll pitch a couple also for the audience, like Cassie Kozrakov is very good writing about decision science. Um, ben Stencil writes very well, very entertaining about um, data platforms, what it's like to be an analyst. Um, so yeah, if there are any, um, I don't know, Substack, Medium or Twitter personalities that you personally um, yeah, read on the weekends. Who wants to answer this? Manuela, what's your favorite podcaster? <laughs> yeah, I have to be honest here. My, my favorite podcaster is, has nothing to do with data science. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I, as I said, I'm not that long in that field, so I did not really find like one person who I'm like frequently following and who I deem to be the perfect role model or whatever. Uh, in, a, in a digital world. Um, there are some I really um, like to like follow or like to listen to in the 
more real work, like colleagues of mine, also Olivia and Anita, for example, very, very important role models for me personally. Um, yeah, and as I'm not on Twitter, I cannot <laughs> answer for Twitter, I'm really sorry. Um, but I'm more like um, general um, uh, contributions on platforms like towards data science, I appreciate a lot. Um, but there's like, not like one character that like crystallized here uh, out of, of the whole um, bunch of, of, of um, good people out there for me, which I would now recommend or c can recommend from the depth of my heart because there are just so many. Uh, yeah, so from my side, since I'm more in the legal, legal and regulation side, I'm following very closely the AI Act newsletter, <laughs> which is very important. Also from data science perspective, uh, important because it, you might find some advices in future how to treat your favorite data science subject and where, that, that you know whether it's a hazard um, a very high risk subject or whether it's um, less risky um, but, and considered by the European Union as yeah, less risky and you, you don't have to care as much. But if you are in uh, education, for example, you have to be very responsible with the content and um, for example, machine learning and data science, you need to be very uh, responsible in regards of testing and um, testing your uh, how, how many test cycles and so they are very uh, precisely already in the, in the current act. So this is what I'm actually following very closely and what is also um, re requested very often is from a certain discipline um, that people don't know how to, for example, automotive um, and uh, automotive and um, data science or machine learning that don't know how, where they are actually localized on this act in the regulation. So they don't know, uh, um, should, I, should I take care or uh, am I com can, I, can I leave it out? But if I leave it out, the, the problem is it, it will come back. So it's better not to leave it out. We, sh we should consider it as, as a whole because each framework, uh, each system in, in the future might, might contain whether it's generative AI, any sort of um, AI system, we, we uh, we have parts and elements where data scientists will work on. Yeah. Uh, may, may, may I, may, just a question to mm. that, what you said. So the AI Act newsletter, is this the one from Charlotte Sticks or is this another one? Yes, ah, thank, thank you for asking. There are two. There is the one, this one from Charlotte Sticks. She's covering, um, she, what she's doing is she's summarizing um, this on a very high level. Um, for the European Union, and then there is another, the e EU Euro European newsletter, which is another newsletter, so we have different ones, but I would definitely also recommend following Charlotte Sticks, which she's um, Austrian, and she, I think she lives now in Brussels, and she's doing this uh, on a regular note, collecting all of the, uh, collecting all of the, the stuff which is in AI and, uh, and uh, data science, and that is connected to, to the uh, AI Act on the very long run, which is, um, not, it, it is now not in force, it will be in force next year, but it's still a lot to, to argue and to do until then. Mm. Yeah. Thanks for asking. <laughs> Maybe I can also add something, yes. although I'm not a panelist. Okay. I really like the page, information is beautiful. So it shows different ways of presenting data that are actual at the moment. And this is also something that inspired us, you know, for, for how to, to, to visualize also data and to see that information can be something very exciting when you present it in an exciting and innovative way. So I think that's one that I like most. Are there uh, any more questions from the audience? Uh, sorry for my, uh, my question. Uh, thank you first of all for uh, your uh, powerful uh, presentation and for this uh, big motivation about uh, data science for different diversity, I mean women or men. So uh, the thing is that, uh, of course, we see this big motivation about uh, data science, but uh, there is a threat around us, which is AI. Do you think AI will take 
uh, the role of data science. So instead of human data science, we have a robot data science. So uh, enable to, it can be uh, going to uh, develop a project and uh, make analysis and such as that. Thank you for your answer. Okay, L let me try. <laughs> so I would say that science is a skill. It's, you can see it like a craft, a craft, like a handwork that you, you get um, knowledge in, uh, in, this, in this skill. And um, compared to AI, AI is the very big picture as a whole. And in, in AI, you d uh, distinguish between hard AI and weak AI, uh, weak AI, soft AI, whatever, how they call it. So we are speaking about, nowadays we are speaking about soft AI and, or generative AI, where uh, you get a lot of answers from an um, expert system like ChatGPT. Um, yeah, but for this, um, data science is only plays a is a is a really minor role. It's a craft that you use to to analyze, to manipulate data sets. Like um, Chilean said, there are a couple of languages, but AI is real is a lot of bigger like subsystems. An AI system can consist of of 10 or 15 different uh, systems in a car, for example. I mean AGI, artificial mm. intelligence, so like a kind of reasonability. For example, let us assume that say, we have a platform like ChatGPT, and we give, for example, uh, by a kind of data like text or something like that, we need to do like this, and he will, for example, import the data from a site, and then uh, apply some manipulation and uh, apply some, uh, some reasonability on it. Because, of course, it needs to be more developed, the reasonability. It's not yet. But I'm thinking about if, if uh, in the near future, if we have this, such, this kind of... Um, maybe I can also step into that answer. So um, I, I think we can discuss that now for a very long, long duration. But um, two thoughts on that. First, um, um, the, the task of a data scientist, as we heard today, is not only um, data pipelining and coding and, and stuff like that, but it's all about also um, understanding use cases, understanding the needs of, I don't know, your stakeholders, society, whatever, um, communicating the results you, um, you achieved in, with an algorithm. Um, and uh, it's also a lot about soft skills. So I think um, even though we now have opportunities like ChatGPT where we can generate code, this is nothing or this is not substituting um, everything a data scientist does. Um, it's, it's a supportive tool, it's something you can maybe use to be more efficient in some tasks you have to do as a data scientist, but overall you still have to evaluate the model, you still have to see if the outcome um, fits to your data, if the, or if the AI maybe did something which we call hallucinations, um, uh, took some, some informations which actually are not there in the data and made it up themselves, whatever. And the second thing I wanted to add here is that um, we are still um, not at the point where um, you can just use the AI on, on, on anything because um, the, the, the data has to be known to um, the large language model in the end and companies like Infineon or LAM, um, they will not just take all their knowledge, all their data, all they have and put it into a large language model which is not run on their premises. So I think, and this is, will, will be true for many companies. Maybe you heard about Samsung, which banished ChatGPT from their um, from their company site because they were afraid of data leaks and stuff like that. So um, maybe if local models in companies are um, set up and they start to work with that uh, in the near future, it can be a supportive tool for a data scientist working there. But um, in the stage we are now, I think um, with ChatGPT, you cannot substitute a data scientist working for. Infineon, Lamb, you name it. Yeah. Thank you very much. So, are there any more questions? Yes, from the chat, please, Andrea. Oh. Uh, not, not from the chat, but from me. <laughs> <laughs> so, sadly, there are no questions in the chat, so there I, will, I will jump in. So, we heard now a lot about how to become a data scientist, and we have also a lot of students here. We also heard about, okay, student initiatives and so on. But I would be interested in, maybe I still, I'm not, I mean, I am a data scientist, but maybe some here in the, in the room, they did not decide yet. 
in which direction could they head? We know it's all about data, it's math, statistics, it's programming. What would be a soft go into the direction of data scientists? What would you recommend? Where to start when you're maybe not like already a professional or you want to try but you're not totally sure? What's the, the soft entry into the field? So maybe it can be gaming. <laughs> so Marie <laughs> and Xenia, I'm sure they, they would agree that that is a, a good entry into becoming da more data scientist role. What do you think? <laughs> or arts, as we have seen, of course. Yeah, I would say that there are a lot of massive online courses and anyone who wants to try, just go to some platform and try it out so that you're at least a bit familiar with what you will be working on later on. Yeah, also, uh, I have to do a bit of commercial for another company in, or uh, um, besides Women in AI, the girls in IT <laughs> offer a really good course together with Microsoft. Um, hands on, I, I, I really heard the best. So in, in terms of people who have never heard a word about machine learning and data science have done this and said, um, no, I understand. No, I know how to do um, um, like de a decision making uh, machine or de they are trying out very small examples in a very short time. And afterwards, you know whether you like it or whether you will never go there. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, are there any more questions? Olivia. I, I, since there's no, I don't know, there's nothing from the community, so I, um, maybe just a comment, and maybe someone from you want to comment on that as well. It's uh, fair enough and good that in the last round, when you asked the question, I needed it, why is it needed why we have, that we have women in data science, right? And most of you, of course, um, thought about and explained the diversity is important. We have to make fair decisions. That's everything that's great. But did you think about or do you want to comment maybe that this is also needed to have like gender pay gap reduced? Do you think that this really helps? Or will the gender gap still persist because we know we are women? We don't ask as much as men for give, get, getting a salary increase because this is something we don't talk normally, like not so many women talk about that, but this is also something we have to think about because just making the world better and more fair, this is, this is great, but there are also hard facts, right, in life. Who would like to comment on you, this? You also don't have to comment, you just, as you like. I think it would help but I have to um, be proud of Slovenia because we are very low on gender gap uh, in Europe. So we are, um, our gender gap is not as big as in uh, the average of Europe. So, but still, uh, it would help, of course, this would certainly help. Yes, because representation of women are also represented in like hard, topics like data science. I mean, with your recognized experts there equally as men, of course, I hope that we can, you know, um, at some point have this equal pay day in Austria, not in March or whenever, but somewhere at the 31st of December. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, Andrea. We have a question from we the online the community. Question. Yes, we have. So I think it's a really nice question to, to round this up because I think we are like, um, time is more or less up. How would you describe the whole data science process in three words? That's a tough one. <laughs> Manuela. Um, this will maybe require a bit of um, thinking around the corner, but um, when I think about data science or my experiences with data science, I always think about um, B. Sherlock Holmes. 
So like diving deep into a topic which you maybe have no idea about, enjoying the dirty work, the hard work, um, and then really enjoy also the moment when you find the needle in the haystack, when you find the one information you're looking for, or maybe something completely unexpected, and, and enjoy like this moment after all this digging deep, asking questions, um, when you finally got an answer. Okay, I hope this answers the question. So, I would like to wrap it up here with the panel discussion. I would like to thank you all for sharing with us your expertise, your thoughts, also your dreams, your concerns, and your suggestions. Thank you very much. So we prepared a few presents for you, so, so that you always remember we're women in data science and we're still women. So it's earrings with our logo. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, so this was the final point on our agenda. Now it's just me, the one who has the honor to close the event today. So uh, we are now at the end of the fourth Women in Data Science. Thank you all for joining. It was a great day. We learned so much. I learned a lot about gaming, which I didn't learn knew before, about customer lifetime value, about uh, that we all more or less face the same challenge. It doesn't matter which background or which yeah, which uh, field you're working in. Uh, we are all challenged by our data. And I think that the last statement, I like it a lot. I invite you all, all of you who are maybe thinking about going to the field, think about being Sherlock Holmes, right? If you like that, if you like to solve uh, like puzzles or if you like to solve riddles, go there. That, that's great. That's the best start for being a data scientist. And um, yeah. I'm really happy how this conference developed in the last years and I just, uh, I said it already in the beginning today, but I just want to repeat it. Thank you to everyone who, who made this possible. Maybe now I have to switch, right? Ah oh, yeah, no, I don't, huh? like this. Okay, thank you everyone who made this possible and therefore I also want to invite now the whole team on stage. Yeah, we take the time, everybody please on stage, that you all see the many, many, many people working with us also uh, some are had to go already, unfortunately, but everyone else, come on stage, uh, get your applause. <laughs> Please in front, in front, maybe someone can take a picture. Still someone here, yeah, cool. Not behind the chairs, in front of the chairs. <laughs> yeah, great. So thanks, thank you very, very much for supporting that. Okay, just, just that you saw everyone once, once in a while. And now, um, yeah, you, you saw already that we cover quite diverse topics. The, the community is quite diverse, not as diverse as it could be. Of course, we are seeking for more. We will continue, of course. So first thing, um, how can we continue? We continue best if you give us feedback. So please, everyone, take out your phone, scan the QR code, and then before you leave, leave us, these are just four questions. Answer these four questions it helps us a lot to further improve for next year. So I wait for a few seconds that you scan the QR code. If not, there are also outside a lot of these QR codes that you can scan afterwards. Every feedback is highly welcome. There's, there's a code needed. Oh my God. So who is the responsible? Manu, Manu? 
Der war, ah, okay. Oh my God, okay, this is now, we will manage that. <laughs> Did anybody try this today during the day already? Did it work without code? Sorry? Ah, thank you very much. It's because the person setting up is not here today. So the code is WITS2023. Thanks. It's 2023, back to the audience. Is that right? WITS 2023? Okay. With a small i. So capital W I capital D S. Okay. Learn something again. Thank you very much for that. So yeah, note to us next year, no code, please. Um, then before before we say goodbye, uh, short announcements, right? So there will be a next Women Data Science. We decided already that we will continue because, yes, we have quite good response. We're, it's a lot of work, but we all enjoy it so much and we have quite a lot of fun doing it and also we enjoy the whole day. So, of course, we will continue. We're happy to invite you again here to Villach next year, uh, also to join us online, of course. Um, it will be somewhere in May. We will send out the invitation with our newsletter as soon as we fix the date, as soon as we arranged everything with the, with the rooms and so on, so you will be informed. Or follow us on Twitter, or follow, uh, no, not us on Twitter, it's either me on Twitter or Anita, for example, or uh, follow us on LinkedIn, because LinkedIn is our main channel where we share all this information. Then, what else? The videos, of course, we recorded everything. They will be cut now. And then we will make them accessible at our YouTube channel. So we will inform you as well. As soon as they are online, then you can re-watch your, your preferred sessions or all the sessions, however you want to. And yeah, connect with us. Um, we are many already. But nonetheless, I invite everyone who would like to join our team to say, okay, that's a cool initiative. I want to help out. We are happy for every hand that helps us. Uh, so as I said, we're an NGO. Nobody gets paid, but it's a lot of fun. So <laughs> feel free uh, to join us. Um, what else? Also, reach out. I haven't said that in the morning, I think. So if you have cool topics for next year. We're always like doing a brainstorming someone in autumn to say, okay, what could be cool topics for next year? If you have any ideas now already in the moment, write me, write us an email. So if you write to office at Witzvillach, you directly reach me and I, I'm happy to collect now already the ideas for next year. Also, if you would like to be a speaker, so don't be shy to say, okay, I would like to be a speaker. I want to present my work next year. Just reach out to us. We will make that possible. Okay. So, and with that said, we are really done. Um, I want to thank again our sponsors and supporters and thank you all for being here. Thanks for this great day and see you hopefully next year. Have a safe trip home as well.